everyone. So welcome to uh, this uh, ceremony. And uh, on behalf of the laboratory of Marseille University, and of course, uh, the uh, two committees for the research and we are very proud to uh, host this uh, World Prize ceremony. And uh, now I would like to uh, let Sarah to present the rest of the ceremony. And welcome to all of you for the presentation of the 24th Annual River Cosmology Prize. Honoring leading cosmologist, astronomer, astrophysicist, or scientific philosopher for theoretical, analytical, or conceptual discoveries leading to fundamental advances in our understanding of the universe. On behalf of all of us at the Foundation, we are pleased to be here in Marseille to present this prize at the 16th edition of the Gecko Team Conference Site Club. Um, thank you for your warm welcome. The Cosmology Prize is presented annually in conjunction with the International Astronomical Union, whose support and partnership has guided our efforts since the earliest days. It is my pleasure to introduce Teresa Lago, an IAU advisor, who will say a few words about this fruitful collaboration. Thank you, Sarah. So the IU is pleased to have collaborated with the Guild of Cosmology Prize since the prize inception. <laughs> as an advisory role in the constitution of the selection advisory board, and as part of our collaboration, we are fortunate to receive an annual grant of seventy-five thousand dollars to be awarded to postdoctoral fellows from around the world. So they can pursue education and research at centers of excellence in their fields. The fellowship has been awarded to young scientists for 16 countries or so, like Algeria, China, Chile, Poland, Poland Taiwan, India, Spain, Italy, Israel, Greece, Belgium, uh, the Netherlands, the Russian Federation, Mexico. Uh, UK, Colombia, Egypt, United States, and this year, 2023, we had a new country, Iran. The 2023 fellows are Mohit Bardwaj, Marina, to, uh, I will say a couple of words. Uh, Mohit is from India. He received his PhD in 2022 from uh, the Martial uh, University in Montreal. And uh, he's, he works on uh, Origins of the fast radio burst as a call to the industrial media. This global fellowship will be used for collaborations, conference attendance, and publication costs. The next uh, prize, or the second prize, is to Marina Genki. She's from Brazil. She also had a previous PhD in 2022 from the Federal University of Santa Maria. A research focus on studying molecular outflows with the GWST and Posidis to determine the mass loading in the cellular media. She will also use a, a global fellowship for conference appearance, publication process, and competitive feedback. The third fellowship I'm delighted to see her here, I just met her, is to Puni Nazari from Iran. She, uh, I think she got already a PhD or is about yeah, to receive it <laughs> from Leiden University in the Netherlands. Uh, in her research, she studies the relationship between planetary composition and protostellar evolution using ARMA and GWST data combined with theoretical models. Uh, she will uh, use a rubric fellowship to visit collaborators to organize a workshop to offer and nicely to offer summer projects to be made students from the legal deliveries. So uh, my remarks have to be short and thank you, Sarah, for this. Thank you, Dr. Lavo, and congratulations to the three fellows, especially to you for being <laughs> Thank you.
The Gruber International Prize Program was established in 2000, and it recognizes achievements and discoveries that produce fundamental shifts in human knowledge and culture. While we are here to honor the achievements of Richard Ellis, let me mention that the Genetics Prize will be presented at the International Congress of Genetics on July 19th to Alan Jacobson and Lynn McQuad. On November 12th, at the annual meeting of the Society for Neuroscience, the Neuroscience Prize will be presented to Huda Akir. Please note also that nominations to the 2024 Gruber Prizes will be open until December 15th of this year, and that we encourage nominations that reflect the breadth of the fields and the diversity of those working within them. Before we return to cosmology, I would like to acknowledge our co-founders, Peter and Patricia Gruber, whose combined, combined vision and leadership established this international prize program, and whose care in doing so gave it the legs to stand on its own. Peter has passed, but Pat remains the heart of the program, and she's a lifetime member of the board of directors. We wish she'd been able to join us here today. I bet she's watching. Uh, returning to cosmology, we are proud of our illustrious laureate roster, and we are pleased to be adding to it today. The 2023 prize recipient was chosen by a distinguished selection advisory board, several of whom are with us uh, in the room. We deeply appreciate the knowledge, commitment, and enthusiasm that these advisors bring to the judging process. And let me now invite a member of this board, Jean-Luc Puget, to present the official prize citation and introduce the scientific accomplishments of our recipient. <clears throat> <clears throat> the citation for the Gruber Foundation is pleased to present the 2023 Cosmology Prize, Charles S. Ellis, for his numerous contributions in the field of galaxy evolution, the onset of cosmodrome, and realization of the high redshift of the universe, and detection of the earliest galaxies via the Hubble Ultrady field study. Richard S. Ellis has also driven several frontiers of instrumental developments in optical astronomy, especially the use of multi object spectroscopy to study many galaxies in the same field of view. These included the autofill, the 2DF facility on the Euro Australian telescope, which led to the discovery of barium acoustic oscillation. <coughs> The NDSS on the Perchel telescope, which studied the redshift of faint galaxies, and the PFS currently under commissioning of the Subaru telescope to study dark matter and dark energy. I want to make a view. Major, may rather have remarked. Richard Ellis has, through over 40 years of pioneering contribution, helped design and construct new instruments and open the high redshift universe to direct observations. He has secured funds for a series of faint object multi fiber multi spectrometer, and via the early spectroscopic surveys, the early and the SD LDSS surveys, Richard Ellis became the leading authority on the faint galaxy evolution. The nature of the source of the realization of the universe was for a long time a problem for cosmology, and the identification of the cosmic dome or galaxy first light was set as a major science goal for the GFUs. Through the statistics of the Lyman Alpha emission seen in spectra taken with the Keck te telescopes, Ellis has provided important constraints on when cosmic ionization ended for our projects. Nevertheless, the start of ionization was still not observed, and many additional mechanisms were proposed. Was a theorist a project chair decade ago that most likely source was easy, was the early generation of star forming systems. 
Parce que le principe, on est bien clair, c'est une bonne traduction de fille, serait ten years ago, Alice used a chest to measure the first abundance of star forming galaxies to redshift 10. It was spectroscopic observation of 10 galaxies that have shown that other galaxies play a key role in the star forming station. Now, nevertheless, uh, uh, mention uh, uh, a cup in this the history of the realization parameter of uh, uh, the CMB from uh, uh, the WMAP satellite was given fairly high in uh, point, point, point 15 and uh, the Planck satellite luckily enough brought that down and basically in uh, not in contradiction with uh, the galaxy. In, uh, eight, in 2018, with Japanese colleagues, uh, uh, Ellis brought his record, his own record that shifted in the galaxy at 9.1. The estimate of the stellar population age to indicate the formation of this galaxy in the region of 12 to 15, and that leaves some space on quite a bit of a space. Uh, it of the GWST to detect really the first uh, magnet. And this made also significant contribution to the discovery of the dark energy using super, supernova as kernel standard candles. And this specific contribution would include the discovery of some of the very first supernovae at cosmological distance. And with this uh, uh, postdoc, Jean Paul Knell, that many people might know here because he has been near Marseille. He was the first to show how gravitational by large scale structure can be used to explore the distant universe. Cosmic shear is now the primary driver for the large surveys LSST W first UT launched a week ago successfully to constrain dark energy evolution. This illustrates the diversity and importance of the often pioneer um, contribution of uh, Richard Ellis to, astro to astrophysics and cosmology. So, uh, Richard Ellis, uh, please come on front to receive the prize. First, let me, before I figure out how to get my talk up, um, let me um, just say a few words of that. Thank you, Jean Louis, for those very kind words. And thank you, Teresa, for coming to Marseille to represent the International Astronomical Union. I thank the Patricia and Peter Gruber Foundation very much for their, their vision and generous support of astronomy. Uh, particularly through the fellowship program, which gives young people uh, a boost in their early career, um, which we saw from those fellows that have just been awarded today. Now, I'm clearly not an early career researcher, um, and so talking now about my own prize, um, I'm very humbled to get this uh, prize, uh, because if I look at the previous recipients, uh, many of them are my personal heroes. Um, I decided to be an astronomer at the age of six, and I've been very lucky that throughout my life I was able to do what I enjoyed doing, looking through telescopes. 
And uh, I lived through a golden era where technology and telescopes enabled us to do things that were previously impossible. And I think it's highly appropriate that we're at this meeting organized by Denny and others, uh, where you young people are witnessing the beginning of another golden era, and that is through the amazing performance of the James Webb Space Telescope. So, in this talk, which I'll try and get up in a minute, um, I will uh, go through some of the path that brought us to where we are, and talk about some of the prospects. So. Okay, so, um, finally. Okay, so, um, I just want to say thank you uh, once again to... Um, Oh, okay. to Peter and uh, Patricia uh, Gruber, and uh, represented here Sarah and Stephanie, who have been really very helpful in setting up all this meeting. And, uh, so, um, what I plan to do uh, is tell you about Cosmic Dawn. Now, it's been a bit of a difficult talk to prepare because, you know, back there are all the world's experts on exactly this topic. They've been here all week uh, debating it. Uh, but of course, there are many in the audience who don't work in this field, visitors who come. And so I've tried to uh, bridge this uh, range of expertise uh, so that hopefully everybody gets something uh, out of this uh, talk. So, um, firstly, what is Cosmic Dawn? So, and why is it important? Well, firstly, I'm showing this cartoon from Abby Love. Now, He's very famous at the moment because he's digging up evidence of extraterrestrial objects yes. uh, at the bottom of the ocean. But whatever you think about his passion for that, he has been a pioneer in the study of early galaxies. And this cartoon is taken from one of his Scientific American articles. Uh, time is running from left to right, and um, 370,000 years after the Big Bang, uh, the universe is expanding and cools, and the hydrogen having for forms for the first time. And those hydrogen clouds are seeded uh, gravitationally by dark matter, which is already fractionated out of the expansion of the universe much earlier. So they cluster around the dark matter, and eventually they become genes unstable, and they collapse and heat up, and we get nuclear ignition. Uh, but those stars in those early systems don't have the heavy chemical elements that we see in the sun. So for a given mass, they're much hotter. Uh, than the stars uh, that we see today. So they emit copious amounts of ultraviolet photons, which allows them to photoionize the intergalactic medium. Uh, so these ionized bubbles grow in size as time progresses. Many more of these bubbles form as more systems collapse. And the universe eventually, through this ionizing process, becomes fully ionized in intergalactic space. So in this picture, which is clearly a conjecture, uh, Reionization, that is the gradual transformation of hydrogen into an ionized state, is driven by the birth and evolution of galaxies. So, um, I lived for, you know, in the golden era, I told you, and in this period, um, we've seen higher and higher redshift objects uh, probing back to when the universe was very, very young. So, um, I entered my undergraduate career in 1968. And the highest redshift object was at 0.46. And it had been at 0.46 for over 15 years. Rudolf Dinkowski at the Palomar Telescope measured the redshift of oxygen 2, 37 27, in this galaxy with photographic plates on the 200 inch. And that was the redshift record for a long time. And then you can see, as we, the modern era of forming the telescope began, we started probing to redshifts of one and two, and then uh, with Keck and the VLT, we got up to redshifts of six and higher, and then with Alma, we got to redshifts of 10, and now we're at redshifts over 13 with James Webb. So this has been an amazing period uh, to have been observing, because uh, we've clearly entered, for the last 20 years or so, this epoch where we think reionization occurred. And uh, although there are many puzzles, and the young people who start today tell this as quite matter of fact, you know, I want to tell you how hard it's been to get to exactly this point. Um, 
So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time on the history, um, and I'm going to go back to 1988, uh, when I was a professor that I'd just become, this was uh, uh, at Durham University, and we had a conference, uh, it was the first conference ever held on the topic of when did galaxies form, the epoch of galaxy formation. So uh, there was some, uh, anybody, everybody in this picture, uh, you know, it's, it eventually became amazingly uh, talented and did a lot of excellent work. I just want to highlight Jim Peebles. <laughs> Jim Peebles was the inaugural uh, Ruber, Ruber Cosmology Prize winner in 2000 with Alan Sandage. Uh, we have uh, Hiram Spinrad, who was a pioneer of uh, somewhat of one of my heroes, who was a champion of chasing high redshift galaxies at the University of California in Berkeley. We have uh, three of the gang of four that got the Gruber Prize, uh, Simon White, George F. Stathew, Carlos Frank, still with his Mexican moustache there. And you can see also uh, in this picture, Simon Lilly, uh, a very distinguished contributor to the field, Garth Dillingworth, for a long time one of my competitors, but we have actually started yeah. Before leaving this historic uh, picture, for those of you working in cosmology, this is David Spurgle with hair. <laughs> you know, if any of you have seen David Spurgle now, you wouldn't recognize him as this youthful uh, cosmologist. So the first person really to look at the possibility of detecting what were called primeval galaxies, galaxies emerging from darkness was Jim Peebles. And in this paper with Bruce Partridge, both of these guys are, are still fine and doing well, um, they were driven by um, a very famous paper by Edwin Linden Bell and Sandwich, which argued that the Milky Way collapsed in a single monolithic acti act activity. That is that most of the stars formed in a period of only a few hundred million years. So if you imagine all of this mass forming stars on the main sequence in, a, in a, only a couple of hundred million years, you would get uh, a galaxy that is something like 700 times more luminous than the Milky Way. So that, you know, the possibility of seeing these beacons out of the high redshift universe was very intriguing to these two uh, physicists, for instance. And then um, along came Beatrice Finsley. She, was, uh, she sadly died very young um, at Yale University. And at this point, she, and we didn't have the large telescopes that enabled us to get spectra of these objects. That came later. Now, but what we could do is count galaxies. And she predicted that since elliptical galaxies today have giant stars, and they're mostly red giant stars, then at some point in the past, those red giant stars would have been on the main sequence and extremely blue and luminous. So she calculated the luminosity evolution. So redshift increasing to the left here. And you can see that an elliptical galaxy would have been something like four or five magnitudes more luminous uh, at a redshift of, of um, you know, three or four or so. And so she predicted there would be this huge excess but as one counted galaxies to fainter limits, one would see this huge access in the number of galaxies on the sky. And so that's really how I entered the field in 1979 with Bruce Peterson, uh, where we took this photograph on the annual Australian telescope and counted galaxies. And the first hint that this, wasn't, this picture wasn't correct was that we just didn't see this access um, on the sky. And uh, meanwhile, this guy, Spinrad, um, was trying to find evidence of galaxies that were forming stars at such a rate that most of the mass would have been in place during this period when they were being observed. And again, this was driven by uh, Beatrice. Beatrice predicted that this primeval phase uh, would, make, uh, would provide this excess of very intense objects at redshift three. And there were some candidates that were presented by um, the people at Berkeley, Pat McCarthy and George Georgioski, were students and postdocs at Berkeley at the time. So, 
John Doe mentioned these instruments that I was involved in a long time ago. You know, uh, these spectrographs were built in the 80s, but the goal was to do the first systematic surveys of galaxies at faint limits. And whereas the people like Minkowski and Sandage have measured their redshifts of galaxies, and Jim Garland measured them one by one, it was very clear that this was not a way of doing survey astronomy. And so we, uh, we started looking at the use of optical fibers. Initially, uh, the idea here is that this is, the focal, this is a, a glass plate placed in the focal plane of the telescope, and the fibers are uh, placed at the positions of all the galaxies, 50 of them, in the field of view, uh, and collected into a, a linear slit that goes into a spectrograph. And uh, this is pretty primitive. This is 1981, and you know the, the brass plate has holes drilled. Each hole, each hole is represents a galaxy. So the hole has a number that identifies it with that particular galaxy, and the fiber has a number that tells you where it is in the spectrograph, um, you know, the two-dimensional uh, image. And so here am I writing down which fiber number goes in which hole number. If you lose that piece of paper, you know, the whole project is <laughs> because you don't know which spectrum reaches which. So we, we pretty well decided pretty early on to automate it. So uh, since John Blue mentioned these instruments, this is the robot that we used, uh, AutoFit, which uh, is an electromagnet that picks up these buttons and moves them one by one. It's incredibly crude by today's standards, and largely as a publicity stunt. We used it to make this map of Australia, <laughs> to which the usual response was, what about Tasmania? Um, <laughs> and then finally, this multi-slip instrument that I'm very proud of, because it was very, very cheap to build. It was 18,000 pounds, and yet it gave us very, very faint spectra. So uh, we didn't find this peak. We went all the way to 24th magnitude with four meter telescopes, and we didn't find we only got to redshift one, you know, which to today's um, postdocs and students there at the back of the room, we feel we could almost touch these galaxies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a lot came the cold dark matter picture. And the mistake that Tinsley and Peebles have met was that they assumed that galaxies evolved in isolation. All their stars formed, in, you know, the idea that they merged or they accreted gas continuously, uh, didn't occur to them at the time. And although cold dark matter also goes back to Peebles and Blumenthal and colleagues, um, it's this paper, really, in 1987, Simon White and Ed Barron, um, you know, that looked at um, the visibility in the cold dark matter picture. Because it's a hierarchical ascending model, then, of course, the galaxies uh, more or less evolve slowly. They don't have this enormous excess of high redshift. And that was consistent with the redshift distributions that we were getting. Now we're here in Marseille, and I want to pay tribute to uh, Olivier Lefebvre. I was here a year ago at his memorial meeting, and he was a champion of this systematic uh, survey of, of the distant universe. And uh, at times we were competitors. Uh, when we were doing our work uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, we were competing with Lawrence, who's here, uh, Simon Lilly, Dave Crampton together with But eventually we joined forces, uh, actually, and it was uh, great. He, he played a key role in Euclid, which uh, was successfully launched um, last week. So uh, and he was a very productive astronomer. So when Hubble was launched, we had images of these galaxies for which we had redshifts. And um, it was very tempting uh, to look at the evolution in morphology and conclude uh, that as one goes back in time, galaxies get more irregular, consistent, we thought, with this hierarchical picture. You can see at redshift three, many of these galaxies are, don't have regular forms. And I just want to point out, because we now have images of many of these galaxies with known redshifts from James Webb. And, you know, what looks like irregular galaxies with Hubble, uh, because we can go further into the infrared, 
uh, you can see that they do, in fact, have regular forms, many of them. And so this has been a big surprise, I think. The fact that disk galaxies, um, you know, seem to quite high redshifts with James Webb. We just didn't have the, uh, the sensitivity with Hubble uh, to see the painter features. You know, you classify something like this as an irregular. But when you look very closely with James Webb, uh, by going to longer wavelengths, which of course reflect more accurately the established stellar populations, uh, then the morphologies are different. So not everything that we did with Hubble um, necessarily has stood the test of time. Um, then along came Bob Williams, and he decided to put the stops there and do a very long exposure in one area of sky, the, the Hubble Deep Field. And I'll say later that there were many skeptics. Remember, Hubble had only just been repaired, and the last thing people wanted was another embarrassment uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but he had the courage to make this image public. And I remember uh, seeing this image uh, on an airplane. Uh, it was on the front page of one of the American papers, I think, the Washington Post. And I looked at this image, and the first thing I noticed was that there was still blank sky in between these galaxies, despite this enormous exposure time. And so I, I, I wondered whether we had seen, we'd seen through the peak of the cosmic star formation history. And Pierre Medell and colleagues and showed using the line and break technique. Uh, and this is really the first indication that we penetrated deep enough to see the decline in the star formation history that would herald the search for uh, the beginning of galaxy formation. So I'm nearly done with the history, but I just wanted to say the gravitational lensing is now a routine tool, and really it required uh, some visionaries to, to convince the community. Uh, in the 80s, gravitational lensing was really not a popular field. There weren't that many people working on it. And the Toulouse group really uh, deserved credit uh, for pioneering uh, so this was a group led by Bernard Ford, uh, who was in Toulouse, Yannick Mellier, Genevieve Sukai, uh, Rosa Peno here somewhere, um, and of course, very recently, Nick Kaiser was the pioneer of gravitational lensing. It's very sad that he's no longer with us. So this is a famous cluster, April 2218, um, which really showed the combination of gravitational lensing and Hubble. The exquisite image quality enabled us to see multiple images for the first time that were unambiguous. And that meant we could get mass maps. And uh, I remember being struck by the fact that just the geometry of a, of a cluster and the images in it would enable you to estimate crudely the redshifts of the lensed objects. This is really an incredible step forward, I thought, in proving that imaging through these clusters was going to be very, very popular here. In certain areas, the magnification uh, can formally become infinite. These are the so-called critical lines, where the magnification is particularly small. And uh, jean louis mentioned Jean-Paul Clair, when he was visiting us at Caltech. And we started scanning these critical lines for incredibly highly magnified objects. We knew where the critical lines were as a function of redshift through Jean-Paul's models. And using this cluster at 2218 again, we were able to find some of the most distant galaxies. So it was a really very exciting time. Okay, so that's a brief history of how we got to the use of lensing, how we got to the use of multiple objects, spectrographs, how we started realizing the power of our space telescope. So the questions that we face now are this cosmic dawn, when did it happen? Can we, can reionization help? We have to make the assumption that reionization and cosmic dawn are somehow physically connected. And perhaps the biggest challenge that we've all been thinking about, can we recognize, will we be able to recognize a galaxy emerging from darkness? Will we, will we be able to, will there be some signature that tells us that this is a pristine object? And this is an important quest because in some sense it's just as important as the Big Bang which is, of course, more mysterious. But the cosmic dawn is the beginning of the chemistry uh, that makes up everything. 
we see. So it is the birth, not only of the chemistry that we see around us, but also our own, our own, our own forms of life. So um, plaque comes into the story uh, at this point, and um, the microwave background is, of course, affected by the foreground ionized intergalactic medium. The electrons in the intergalactic medium act as scatterers, they Thomson scatter and polarize uh, the signal. So there's a column of electrons from when reionization begins to the present day. And um, the Clark Consortium measured this optical depth as well as the spatial distribution of the polarization signal. And they estimated that this reionization process was at its peak uh, at a redshift of about eight or so. So this is a big step forward from where we were with the WMAP satellite, where, you know, for all kinds of reasons due to foregrounds and complications, they predicted that the redshift was much higher, almost out of reach of both Hubble and ground-based telescopes. So they they had some parametric models in their 2016 paper which suggested that the universe was more or less neutral at a redshift of 12 uh, and became fully ionized by a redshift of 6. And so we started probing this era uh, with Keck. I was at Caltech for, for 16 years, had very generous access to the Keck telescope. Uh, and of course, Olivia Lefebvre was pounding away as well, and, 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 and at the Army from time and others in Europe. So Dan Stark, who many of you know, and I pounded away with all the spectrographs we had access to, but kept the DMOS, low res, and MOS bar spectrum, and did this ambitious survey of several hundred galaxies out to redshifts beyond six. And many of them show this strong line and alpha line, which is very helpful, but not all of them do. And it was really uh, Dan's idea to measure the fraction. Because um, this line and alpha line is a resonant line with hydrogen. It's easily scattered by neutral gas. So you can think of it as a thermometer that tells us where, where, where the neutral gas is, and you know, whether we're in the neutral era or in the ionized era. And it looked, and this was Schenker's thesis, it looks like as you go to redshift 6, about 50% of the galaxies selected uh, in terms of their luminosity uh, show line alpha. Uh, but then afterwards, as you go to higher and higher redshift, the number decreases dramatically. And many, many independent observers um, confirm this. Now, I want to tell the experts in the audience, I never imagined that this would be a quantitative measure of the neutral fraction, because line and alpha the radiative transfer of line alpha is very, very complicated. There are geometrical effects, um, there's velocity shifts that are very important. I only imagine that this was an indicator, an approximate indicator. But James Webb now has, uh, has made great progress because we have very high quality spectra that allow us also to see the Barmer lines. Now, the, bar, the combination of the line and alpha line and the Barmer line is very, very powerful, as I'm sure many of you know because that enables us to measure the fraction of, of line and alpha that's escaping. And if the neutral region, if there are neutral or ionized bubbles in the intergalactic medium, the, the, the line and alpha line will either be extinguished or will survive. And so what you can see from this very nice uh, paper recently from the Jade team, and the lead author is Ayush Saxena, is that the escape fraction of line and alpha is indeed declining just as uh, Schenker found all those years ago from the CAC data. And so the promise is that we will be able to use this more carefully uh, to measure the uh, neutral fraction as a function of gradually. Now, what did the Planck people say about the beginning of reionization? Well, from Lunde, we were very confident, actually. This is from the 2016 paper. Uh, you said that the, um, the redshift at which reionization begins is 10.4 plus or minus about 2, and you precluded any significant contribution beyond a redshift of 15. Now, remember those models in the Planck paper were parametric models, um, and various workers uh, tried to match this in the standard cobalt model, lambda CBM. And you can see that. 
broadly speaking, they agree, but they do permit this tag of, uh, you know, possible ionized gas, um, you know, out to uh, redshifts of 16 or so. So, you know, the real question was what's out there? How far can we see? And um, that's where this deep field came in. So this was a very interesting time. Uh, this was a collaboration with the group at Edinburgh, Dunlop, Ross McClure, and uh, we found, uh, using the line and break technique, the first objects uh, beyond the redshift of 8.5, including this object at 11.9, which we were very nervous about because it was only seen in one Hubble filter. I mean, you know, I remember giving talks on this at the time, and people were laughing, how can Richard Ellis honestly measure the redshift of an object from a measurement in only one filter, you know? And of course the answer was the line and break we assume uh, was causing it to drop out in all the other filters. Uh, but it could have been an emission line galaxy or an intermediate redshift. So I'll come back to this object in a moment. Uh, the other technique, of course, was, which I was not involved in, was the front end needles, where six clusters were imaged very, very deep with Hubble. And this really was state of the art gravitational lensing, whereas Jean-Paul Knapp and I had maybe a handful of multiple images in which we made the mass models. These guys have up to 180 multiple images, uh, which enables them to make the most exquisite maps and predict the redshifts of the objects that are seen through the cluster. So these two techniques, deep fields and the lensing clusters, uh, brought us more or less up to date um, in explo exploiting the luminosity function. So this is a, a sort of state of the art, really, in the luminosity functions with Hubble in the paper by Richard Bowens, which was published last year. And what you see is the critical role, this is luminosity versus redshift, the critical role of the lens objects, which enable you to probe much fainter down the luminosity function because of the magnification of the clusters. Now, even today, with James Webb, we haven't pushed that far back uh, because all of the basic images from James Webb at the moment largely are black field images. Uh, there are a couple of clusters that have been imaged, but the, the cosmic variance in looking through one or two clusters is really not good enough. We need a larger sample. So, the conclusion prior to the launch of James Webb was the cosmic dawn could well be at a redshift of 12. Pascal Loesch in Geneva was predicting that from these deep images, both gravitational lensing and through deep fields, the numbers were declining very steeply beyond the redshift of 8, as predicted by theory, actually. Whereas the Edinburgh group uh, were predicting, you know, that they could, grab, they could be more gradual. And so there would be galaxies out here. Now, before I leave Hubble and Spitzer, uh, just one other technique. Oh, let me finish with this as well. And that is that, you know, trying to unite the, the vision from Planck and the vision from Hubble. Uh, Brad Robertson and I, uh, Jim Dunlop, looked at the declining uh, number of galaxies seen in the Hubble data and assuming uh, some ionizing properties, concluded that we could match uh, the optical depth to the Planck data. Um, you know, there was no way that we could match uh, the W map and the optical depth. But so that was why it was so refreshing. Uh, the Planck numbers kept coming down, which made, meant that we could really, you know, out to a redshift at 12 or so, we could match the data. So the focus now is on testing these assumptions. So there are two variables that are the ionizing radiation from galaxies, the so-called psi ion. And we had to make assumptions in the Robertson paper drawn from galaxies at redshift 3. But spectroscopy of James Webb is, is pounding away, and this is now, I'm pretty confident that nailing down this psi ion from the, from the, from the Sears and Jay's data uh, is really uh, moving along very nicely. The, the other challenge is how many of these ionizing photons escape. That's a huge hurdle, actually, um, at high redshift, because we can't directly uh, measure it. So uh, we've been trying to make progress by correlating 
the fluctuations in the light and alpha forest in the quasars, uh, with galaxies in the same field, in the same cosmic volume. And, you know, we've made some progress, but it's really hard going. So that's an area that still needs a lot of work. So before I go to James Webb, uh, one other trick, of course, is to measure the ages of stars at high redshift. That would enable you to predict uh, what is beyond Hubble's horizon. So uh, Nicholas Laporte, uh, Guido, Robert Spossani, and I looked at this object, Max JD1. It was thought to be at a redshift of nine and a half. And for many years, it had this amazing break uh, in the Spitzer data. So this is these, the Spitzer photometry here at five microns, 4.6 microns, 3.5 microns, and the Lyman break here. And these, are, these authors argue it could be due to the Barnum break, which is an age indicator. The idea here is hydrogen in the atmospheres of stars reaches a peak. Uh, A-type stars, which have a main sequence lifetime of a few hundred million years. Uh, whereas if you go to hotter stars, the hydrogen is ionized. If you go to lower star, lower mass stars, the hydrogen is in the So the Barma break is like a clock. The, the challenge is that you, we, can't, we couldn't be sure whether this break was due to contamination from this oxygen line. We needed a precise redshift uh, to measure that. So we managed to get that on the VRT. Uh, and also the Japanese collaborators, Hashimoto and Inoue with Alma. And that enabled us to measure the age unambiguously because the, this oxygen line cannot be within this uh, IRAC filter. So this is a galaxy with a redshift 9 who's already got an established uh, population of about 250 years old. Now, we didn't know whether this is a a representative galaxy, and it would be really nice if we could uh, met, uh, confirm this mature age component one other way. And so, um, very recently, last year, uh, we revisited this galaxy with ALMA in a higher resolution extended configuration. And we can see that uh, this galaxy, like several high redshift galaxies studied with ALMA, is rotating. And the mass of the disk uh, determined from this rotation is comparable uh, with the mass that's in the stellar, this mature stellar population. So um, I'm told that this object has been observed with James Webb, and I, I'm told it's rotating but I haven't, in, in oxygen 3, but I haven't uh, yet seen uh, the papers. So I don't know, I hope that they confirm and improve on this mass estimate. So the bottom line is that you know, there were indications before James Webb launched that the stars at, at Redshift 9 were already 200 million years old. So we would expect uh, James Webb to see these galaxies beyond Hubble's horizon. And uh, so here is this amazing instrument. And I was privileged <coughs> literally one month before the pandemic. Uh, at the Spitzer conference in uh, Pasadena to go to Northrop Grumman El Segundo and the clean room uh, and see this monster uh, in person. And here's a human, just to give you some scale. Um, and for me, it was uh, almost a religious experience because I was uh, the only European based member on the committee, the so called Dressler Committee, uh, that proposed this telescope. Uh, called at the time the Next Generation Space Telescope in 1996. 1996 to 2021. That's 25 years. You know, it's pretty incredible. You have to wait that long. So think of all those, you know, when you guys now, or when you see that day, think of all those engineers that spent a significant fraction of their life making it possible for you to enter this golden era of spectroscopy and deep imaging. It's truly amazing, you know. And it works, and it's better than expected. And even better than that, it's going to be up there working for 15 to 20 years. You lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, the initial census is great, because there's more stuff out there. And, you know, I feel kind of vindictive, because, you know, we fought very hard with Pascal Arch. Uh, you know, that the ages of these objects suggested that there was star formation at, at these redshifts. 
Now, why is this theory model, um, you know, here? And it is a very important model. It's a model that assumes lambda CDN, and it assumes that the gas that's falling into the halos is converted into stars at a constant efficiency. And you might say that that's, you know, that's not a very reliable assumption. But you go back to Pascal Oshie's plot. Uh, it works really well, doesn't it? Look, you see, it works so well down here. So, you know, they, the, 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 the theorists thought it would work pretty well all the way. Um, and the fact it doesn't, the fact it doesn't, the galaxies are too bright, is telling us that we're moving into another era. Something has changed. And look at time. You know, it's always, you know, redshift, the linear redshift scale is misleading. So in this period of only 150 million years or so, you know, something, something different is changing in the star formation history. And we don't know what it is. I mean, you know, you've probably been debating it, you have your own views. Andrea Ferrara, who gave a talk here, uh, thinks it's ejected dust. Avishai Gekul thinks it's feedback, it's not affected. That's possible. Um, uh, Yuchi, who's here, uh, you know, is arguing for a top-heavy IMF uh, because the stars are very metal poor, and so they may condense, they may not fragment at the same rate that they do nearby. And a particularly interesting suggestion is these galaxies are still at an early stage and settling down, you know, they're bursting, and, and these bursts make a very big difference at the beginning when the mass of the galaxy is low. So we're seeing galaxies that are temporarily brighter by these bursts. Now, why isn't this happening at lower redshift? Well, as the galaxy gets more luminous and, and, and grows, then these bursts have less of an effect. So this is a very interesting idea. Now, one you know, horrible possibility is these galaxies are not at those redshifts, and let's just dispense with that, because uh, we've started getting spectra of these galaxies now, and that's really where I think the subject is taking off. So here's that galaxy that we were very worried about with Hubble, where we only had one filter detection. Uh, I was absolutely delighted that Emma Curtis Lake, in her paper just before Christmas, um, confirmed. See, we said it was at 11.9 plus minus 3, and it's at 11.6. So retrospectively, we found the most distant galaxy in the public. We, didn't, we weren't convinced at the time. Um, so I don't know that that seems uh, quite, quite a nice way to end our relationship with the Hope for the team. Um, here's, uh, here's the latest. This is as of uh, a week ago, Max de Callum Donner, the Edinburgh compilation of spectroscopic redshift versus photometric redshift. And, you know, I think that's pretty good, actually. You know? And the one pathological object at redshift 16, it really is a very special case where two emission lines just land very unfortunately in the two filters and mimic line and break. Um, so, you know, I don't think that was an embarrassment at all. And then this uh, starship spectrum, which I never thought I'd see, a galaxy in the redshift of 10.6 with all of these chemical elements, enabling us to measure the composition, 10% solar compared to only 1 to 4%. This is a very a typical object. It is very luminous. It may have an AGM. We'll debate that and note. So let's uh, end with cosmic dawn. So this is a simulation of Ionic Cat, uh, snapshot, at uh, redshift 15. Uh, this is a volume that will eventually become something like the Milky Way. And um, the, the, the purple is the gas density of hydrogen, neutral hydrogen. The white areas are areas emitting H beta, so those are an escaping radiation. And the yellow regions are the star forming regions, which are heating up the oxygen to make O3. And uh, if you look at simulations like this, it tells you that this POP3, this sort of golden, you know, he um, the holy grail to find these POP3 objects, uh, mixes with. Um, POP2 and transition is very, very quickly. So POP3 is shown here in green and uh, the total in black. And you can see that, you know, POP3 and POP2 start mixing very, very quickly in time. And in terms of the chemical composition, 
in only something like five million years, uh, a mini halo can pollute very, very quickly uh, from supernovae. So there's a very, very narrow time window to see a pristine uh, system. And, you know, for many years, uh, starting with uh, Daniel Scherer here, uh, 20 years ago, um, this line of uh, uh, ionized helium was thought to be a beacon for detecting uh, top three objects, and uh, Harley uh, confirms this. Um, but it decays very, very quickly compared to the bomb, the bomb line. So again, only in a very short time, you have a very narrow window to see this intense line. And likewise, oxygen is very weak. And so, you know, to prove that there's no oxygen in the spectrum really requires that you're exposed for a very, very long time. So, um, I'm just about to finish, but there have been two recent claims for POP3, very important papers. Um, Eros Manzella, very close to my heart, because he's looking at objects that are extraordinarily highly magnified near the critical lines, just like the chunk clip, chunk John Paul Kev and I were doing uh, in, in the early 2000s. And he found this magnified club. It's only 30 parsecs across. And um, it does have a very intense uh, helium 2. Uh, but unfortunately, the limit on oxygen 3 is, is really not strong enough. So you would have to expose a lot longer uh, to convince us that uh, you know, the metalist is really very, very low. The error bar on his limit, I think, is quite large. Myelino has uh, an object uh, that's a companion to the galaxy that I just showed you from above, <coughs> the galaxy at which is 10.6. Um, and uh, the helium 2 certainly is very, you know, if, if the, the absence of the other lines is, is correct and the helium 2 is robust, then the limit is very good. But unfortunately, at this redshift, we don't see other three. We only have oxygen in the ultraviolet, and that line is unfortunately much weaker usually, so the challenge is still there. So, you know, I think the end point I would say, and this I'm sort of looking into the future now, will we wake up one day and say we found a top three pristine galaxy? And I, I worry that that's going to be very difficult. Uh, I could be wrong. Firstly, the time window is very, very short. It's the needle in a haystack problem. And secondly, the top three regions that we could identify, they could be lying in enriched re regions of the same galaxy with the top two mm -hmm. systems. And so, you know, my, my view is that the holy grail of finding this moment is likely to come from a statistical program uh, that traces the decline in the, in the star formation rate density, that like the debate I showed you with Pascal Ocean. Uh, and likewise, in a measurement of gas phase metallicity as a function. And coming very soon on the horizon is the square kilometre array, uh, particularly the low frequency version uh, in Australia. And uh, that has the possibility to see the transition from the cooling of the gas from being in sync with the microwave background uh, to being in sync with the, with, with the, with the birth of galaxies, the so called coupling between one and alpha uh, and the 21 centimetre line. But uh, I don't want to end on a uh, depressing note, so I just wanted to say that I'm an optimist. And um, despite the challenges that we all face, uh, experience has told us that uh, we always outperform uh, the facilities that, that we build. In other words, the facilities do much more uh, than we imagine. And just to give you some idea of this, uh, go back to the science case for the Keck telescope in 1985, the so-called Blue Book, and the goal of this telemetry telescope was to measure redshifts of what? And, you know, that's what they thought we would be doing with, with a 10 meter telescope. And then when Hubble, when Bob Williams proposed this Hubble lead field, John McCall agreed that various galaxies would be observed, but it was quite possible none of them would be beyond the redshift of two. And then finally, I think, and this is the most exciting, I think, the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was crucial for measuring that break, which we think is the Barma break in the galaxy at 9.1, um, the Spitzer Space Telescope, you know, thought that it would be ambitious and reached to a redshift of three. 
So unlike politicians, astronomers always deliver much more uh, than they do. And so on that optimistic note, thank you very much. Cosmology Prize. Congratulations again to Richard Ellis. This concludes our program. Please join us outside for a short reception where Professor Ellis will be happy to answer questions. Thank you.